Hello everyone. Welcome to the first lecture session of Unit Five. Uh, unit Five uh, is all about static timing analysis. In this uh, session, we'll uh, look at the concept uh, and the flow. Some of the concepts are since uh, the constraints part is very similar to design compiler, there will be some repetition of the concepts of the constraints. But now we will go much more deeper into. Uh, so in synthesis, we are much more focused about the performance. But STA, we are focused focused upon uh, the fact that the chip should work in all possible components. So uh, we will look at uh, the STA as a concept in the sense that uh, what is it? Uh, what are the principles behind the, the flow? Uh, we will look at uh, some mathematical equations uh, related to the constraints. So it is better if you have your pen and paper ready uh, before continuing forward. So. Uh, the agenda is we will look at the part uh, where STA fits in the ASIC design flow. We we'll look at the importance of STA. We we'll learn. Uh, we will look into look into the operating conditions in some detail. Then we will go on to the timing parts and constraints. We will uh, have a relook at the different sort of constraints that STA check. We will look something at uh, take a look at the clocks. However, there is a, there will be a separate uh, Session in which uh, I'll discuss the clocks in much more detail. Being the, the clocks being the most important part of the thing, we look at something called timing acceptance, and then we look at the flow part. Is that how? What all steps does STA contain? So this is uh, this session will uh, give you a nice overview of STA, and the uh, following sessions we will look at. Each of the part in more detail, like in one of the sessions, we look at clocks in more detail. We look at exceptions. Uh, we look at the interconnects and so on. So, so this is the ASIC design flow. Uh, so, what we are focusing on in this uh, course is on the synthesis part, and plus we are focusing on also. Yeah, we've all seen that uh, the the job of a synthesis tool like the design compiler is to convert RPM into gates. Given a proper set of constraints, right? So I'm assuming that constraints. Uh, so yellow thing, uh, yellow is the output, uh, output or the input. Uh, the blue part represents the flow part or the tool part. So RTL is input to synthesis. Uh, the output is gates. Gate netlist plus constraints. So constraints are again input. They are input also and. When we synthesize, we write out the constraints from design compiler in one of the formats, one of the formats is called ATP, which is understood by most of the patient out here. And these constraints plus the gate level netlist goes as input to the backend tools for flow planning, trace and route. And the output of trace and route is a post layout netlist and a parasitics. So the difference between, uh, so now uh, you have a post layout netlist and a pre, uh, so now. Uh, the process of formal verification can be used to verify that the netlist after synthesis is functionally equivalent to RTA. Please note that formal verification is not vector based. It's a formal, it is again a static method. Uh, so it, the, the coverage is, is very good. Here. So it can be used to check that, uh, in fact, it can be used to verify that any two uh, designs, whether they be in netlist form or RTL form are equivalent, are functionally equivalent. So RTL versus the typical flow is RTL versus pre layout netlist. So this netlist after synthesis, we'll call it the pre layout netlist. So RTL versus pre layout netlist, second step is pre layout netlist versus post, post layout netlist. Now this is the functionality part. Now we come to the timing part. STA is used to make sure that the netlist is good from timing point of view. And this STA is called post layout STA, which takes into account the constraints. So it takes into account three things the constraints, the post layout netlist, and the parasitics. These three are the inputs that go into an STA tool like prime time. And using the process of STA, we make sure that the, uh, the design is good for manufacturing, good for fabrication. This whole process of making sure that design is good for manufacturing is called sign off. And the output of this process is the GBS. So the place and route, uh, there, there are a lot of back end verification checks that run on place and route at least. 
um, most of the popular ones are LVS and DRC. And once they have done sign off using prime time, LVS and DRC using the backend tools, we can be sure that the design is good for fabrication. The output is GDS. It is a is a graphic data stream file that we send it to uh, the fabrication lab like PSMP and they use it to manufacture the chip. So STA is done at two levels. The post layout STA I was talking about. There's one more STA and at three layout level. What we were doing in design compiler. So we were doing in we were reporting timing in design compiler. We were taking the constraints in design compiler. All this is part of the pre layout STA. Now the pre layout STA only helps us in finalizing the constraint and nothing more. Otherwise, uh, any timing result at pre layout level is not valuable and good enough for sign off. Sign off has to be done with complete parasitic data. So the idea of pre layout network is to clean up the constraints. Make sure you have all the exceptions in place. Make sure the clock frequencies are correct. Make sure that your uh, design does not have big violations, or in fact, if it has zero violations, or synthesis. So this will the pre-layout SDA will make sure that the synthesis method is of good quality. But the real violations, the real timing problems, will only come after the layout has been done. Hopefully, we will have we'll see some examples in the lab. Uh, then we'll do one session about with the post layout SDA. That means with the past system. So what STA checks? Uh, STA checks all possible paths. It's not vector driven. The simulation, on the other hand, is vector driven in the sense that you give some values at inputs and you expect some values at the outputs, right? And you have to make sure that you cover all possible combinations. It is not the same with STA. STA is not not vector driven. It checks all the possible timing paths in the design. Checking is quite fast compared to dynamic timing simulation compared to timing so compared to the, the verification that we do with uh, providing the stimulus. It does not replace simulation. The important fact is it only checks timing. It is not a functionality check. How do you check functionality? By doing verification plus formal verification. So STA does not replace functional verification. STA is comprised of majorly two parts. First part is delay calculation, second part is time. That means first delays are calculated, then they are checked against the constraints. What are the types of checks that are performed? Setup, hold, recovery, removal, etc. You can also have some sophisticated user defined data to data timing constraints for few of the interfaces for uh, there are some interfaces which you need to check that one data line arrives uh, no later or no faster than some timing constraints with respect to some other data signal. You could have these kind of checks. Then clock gating, we saw clock gating in design compiler. Uh, there are clock gating setup and hold checks which you can do with SPA. Minimum period and pulse width checks can be done. All design rules can be done. Minimum maximum transition time, capacitance, fan out, all these. Again, important point: all these checks that comprise sign off will be done at the post layout level. Now, when we talk about STA, we have to talk about operating conditions. Since STA is done at multiple operating conditions, uh, just try and compare this with synthesis. Synthesis is always done at the worst operating condition. Why? Because we are only concerned about the performance of the design. But here, we are concerned about we are concerned that the chip should work at all possible operating corners. These corners are called operating conditions. T, V, and T. T is for process, V is for voltage, T is for temperature. Now, what does process mean? Now, on a particular wafer and on a die, not so. Let's talk about wafer. A wafer has multiple chips. Now, all the chips are not going to have same performance. The chips on the corner of the the chips will be which are on the periphery will have different performance when compared to chips that are placed in the middle of the wafer. Now, let's talk about the die. That is one 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 chip. Now on one die, not all NMOS and PMOS will behave in a similar fashion. Some of them will be faster, some of them will be slow. Right? This is called process variation. STA, in fact, the whole purpose of STA is to make sure that your chip works in spite of these process variations. There are two types of variations. Uh, I'll have uh, I'll try and fit in a lecture which talks about variations. Because STA is uh, very tightly tied with how the variations take 
take place in the chip. So some of the variations come under the category of systematic variations. That means these variations affect either all the wafers in a similar fashion or all the dyes on the same wafer on the same wafer in a similar fashion. So for example, let's say you are targeting a 65 nanometer process. Now let's say they process the, the whole fabrication process by a particular fabrication lab is not optimized and there is some error in their formula or some error in their in the in the manufacturing process which will result into all devices that have fabrication value greater than 60 This is called a systematic variation. It can be you systematic variation can be corrected by making some corrections in the fabrication flow. So if I if the fabrication guy finds out that you no know, all the devices on the on a 60 nanometer technology load node are not actually 65 nanometer, they are let's say 67 or 68, then the fabrication guys need to make a correction to make sure that systematic variations are minimal. Second is called random variation on such a small scale of manufacturing. Let's say again we talk about 60 nanometer. Not all PMOS and NMOS devices will have the same channel. They will most probably follow a Gaussian curve. We'll see an example of that. And the average of that, most of the devices will have channel lengths that are very close to 60 nanometer. Some of them will have will be beyond 60 nanometer. Some of them will have channel lengths that are less than 60 nanometer. So this is type of variation is called random variation. It is modeled by Gaussian distribution. We uh, let's talk about voltage. All the cells, all the instances don't get same voltage. There is IL drop in the power rail. Even the power supply does not provide. Let's say you are targeting a 1.0 volt power supply. Even the power supply is going to have some variation, maybe 1% or 2% in the power supply. Rate. So all the cells don't get the same voltage. Let's talk about temperature. Chip will heat up during operation. Not all parts or all cells on the chip will heat up at the same degree. So there will be. So one part of the chip will be different than the other part of the chip, whether it be in terms of process or voltage or temperature. SPA should guarantee that chip works across different corners, right. This is called corner based SPA. In uh, today's world, we do corner based SPA, but there is also something called statistical SPA which is gaining importance. Just because of the fact, the fact that all such defect parameters, all such variations can be captured in a statistical way and it will, so now it, as, as technology shrinks, the number of corners are increasing. So we will not talk more about, we will not talk in detail about this in this lecture, there is, I will probably present one more session on, on variation, there we will see how uh, and uh, in what manner the variation is affecting the SPA power. So all the discussions we have in the, uh, in unit 5 will be focused on corner based SPA. That means we we'll have well defined corners and on each of these corners we have to make sure that our chip meets timing constraints. So this is what I am talking about. So uh, now the delay of uh, a cell at a library at a standard cell library level depends on the input transition and output load we have seen that. So delay is a function of input slew, the load. And now every technology lab you have on every corner you have one technology, you have one, the each cell, the delay will be characterized for each corner that we have chosen. So for each PVT, so ultimately delay depends on PVT, for one PVT there is one library, in each of those library you have a cell and characterization is based on the input slew and output load. So there are five parameters here, PVT, slew and load. Now let's look at one particular parameter. Now there are hundreds of parameters, channel length, thickness of the oxide and so on. There are so many uh, dielectric of the oxide and so on. So there are so many parameters that are affected by the variation by process variation. Let's look at one channel length. Now if you look at the channel length on let's say we choose 65 nanometer technology load and we measure the channel length of each and every transform chip, we will see that a graph of something of this kind will emerge, right? Graph like this is called a Gaussian curve. A Gaussian curve is centered around a typical value, in this case it will be 65 nanometer, and 
there will be a lot of some devices which show channel length which is less than 65, there will be devices which show channel length greater than 65. So, the distribution looks like this. So, this is x axis is channel length, y axis is number of samples. Now, let us plot two such uh, parameters one is channel length. Now, we on x axis there is channel length. Now, okay, let us first keep clarify some doubts about the, the Gaussian curve on the left. Now, this uh, Gaussian curve has two parameters one is called the mean or the average, which is a typical value. Other is called the standard deviation. Standard deviation tells us what is the width of this curve. Now, uh, how wide is this curve? Now, typically, uh, up to three sigma. Uh, sigma is nothing but the uh, standard deviation. Typically, the the 90 more than 99 percent of this area comes under plus minus three sigma. That means 65 nanometer. Let's say uh, the time length is the average. And let us say the sigma value is uh, 1 nanometer, for example. So, 3 sigma means 3 nanometer. So, this the, the 90 more than 99 percent of this area will come under the values of 65 plus 3 and 65 minus 3. That is from 62 to 68, it will, will if you take the value from 62 nanometer to 68 nanometer, it will cover more than 99 percent of the area. So, typically the corners are selected. To cover plus minus three sigma, right? Uh, things will become more clear when we talk about duration. But now what we have done is we have plotted the channel length and the threshold voltage of devices on the two axes. Channel length being on x-axis, threshold voltage being on y-axis. Now note that a greater channel length and a greater threshold voltage means a slower device. So somewhere around here, at this point, the, the devices are slow. And somewhere around this point, the devices are fast. In the middle, the devices are typical. That means the devices at the slow corner are, are slower, will have more delay. Devices at faster corner will have faster delay, less delay. So, we have chosen two corners at the two different extremes, and we hope that, or let us say we know that in, in older technologies, that these cover the two extremes of the process arrangement, right. We, we are planning to, to make sure that complete area, this complete area in the middle is covered, right. Obviously, the actual distribution of the devices will be clustered around the middle. Most of the devices will be closer to typical. There will be some devices which will be towards the slower side. There will be some devices which, is, which are towards the faster side. But we do we have to do STA at fast corner and slow corner. What it means? First important thing it means that we are trying to make sure that only very few few of the devices fail. There will be few devices which are even beyond the slow corner and the fast corner. There might be because of the manufacturing process variation. So we are trying to make sure here that most of the devices or more than 99 percent of the devices work. But again, majority of the devices, since they are lying in somewhere in the middle, this analysis will be pessimistic for them. That means we are assuming some, let us say, for slow corner, we are assuming a worst case delay for some gate. But most of the gates will be around the corner, right? So they will not have that high a delay. So this analysis, STA is corner based STA is also in most of the cases pessimistic analysis. That means you are taking margins beyond the typical, but the idea is here is to make sure that almost all the devices work or, or sorry almost all the chips work and they all they meet the required constraints. So, by doing corner based ST although we are pessimistic, but we are at least ensured that the idea is to make sure that the customer does not send back our defective chip right that is the idea. So, if we want to manufacture a processor which meets 1 gigahertz, we have to make sure that it meets 1 gigahertz at this slow corner, right. So, in, in if, we, if, we, if we meet that and we make sure that all the timing constraints are met in the fast corner and slow corner both, most of the, most of the chips manufactured under such conditions will probably have, will probably meet frequencies which are greater than at least maybe 10 to 20 percent greater than 1 gigahertz, it might also happen. Because 
SDA pessimistic, right? Uh, probably you will in estimate, you will uh, appreciate the pessimism or the of the corner based SDA when we discuss about variation, right? Now, uh, what operating conditions we might choose, right? So, in at least in all the all the uh, process con uh, all the technology nodes like 50 nanometer, 90 nanometer, at least we should have two corners. One is the worst case corner, as depicted by this this graph. At least we should have at least two corners: worst case and best case. Worst case corner process type is worst. That means NMOS and PMOS both have slow slow. Voltage is low. Temperature is high. The cell delay is high, which is set up critical. Best case, uh, process type is best, voltage is high, temperature is low, which means that all the devices are on the faster side. It is critical for hold. We'll see why, why I say this. We'll see why the worst case corner is critical for setup, and we'll see why a best case corner is critical for hold. For 65 nanometer, typical operating condition can be 1.0 volt, 85 degrees C. Worst case corner in this case would be 0.9 volt, which is 10% below the BGD. Temperature of 125. Best case corner could be 1.1 volt, which is 10% more than the BGD, and 0 degree C. Temperature depends on the type of environment conditions under which chips will be used. If chips are used for space applications, this temperature would be in negative. If chips are used for household applications, like televisions, uh, mobile phones, and so on, this could be zero. So it depends on the type of operating, the type of environment condition we are targeting for that chip. So this temperature will change based on that. Uh, I already discussed pre and post layout SPA. Let's uh, just summarize this pre layout SPA. No information about the nets. It is all estimated. It is all via load model. Most important thing. Estimated net delay. Use for resolving bottlenecks and finalizing your SPA strategy. This is very important. So you don't wait till the post layout data comes in and then uh, iron out the problems in your constraint. You start working from pre layout level. Post layout will take some time, and meanwhile, you can finalize your SPS strategy. This is very important. Choose the worst corner, same as synthesis, ideal clocks. What it means is that there is no clock pre in place. You will see what ideal. Ideal means that the clock reaches all the clocks at the same time. Let's say you have a single clock in your design, it drives 1000 registers. The clock will reach all the 1000 registers at the same time. In most of the case, the delay would be zero right? because you don't have any information about the delay. Post layout STA uses back annotated net information, which is contained in one of these files, one of these file formats, either SPF or DSPF, done at various corners. We saw minimum you need to, this case was case, clock network fully implemented. The clock tree is done, and you have all the clock network in. So based on whether we are doing pre layout or the post layout SPA, a lot of things change about the clock. The clock constraints would change. We'll see them later. Other other constraints would mostly remain same, but something about the clocks will change. We'll see what. Now, what are the steps of doing SPA? I mean, what the tool actually does. So what tool will do once you feed in the design and the parasitic information based on whether it's pre layout or post layout, if it's pre layout it will be model. The tool will do three steps. It will first break down the circuit into a set of timing paths. We have seen a bit of uh, we saw what timing paths are in synthesis, we'll review them in, in STA. Each for each path delay is calculated and these path delays are checked to make sure the timing constraints have been met. Now let's see so, a couple of important things for combination cells. The only thing important is propagation delay. It is a function of output load and input slope. Sequential cell, apart from the propagation delay from clock to two, you also have timing checks like setup and hold, recovery and removal. Timing checks are function of constraint pin transition and related pin transition. We have seen this in the lab. If you don't remember this, please go back, look at the standard cell library, and see that setup is dependent on what. What uh, what indexes? Right? What are the indices of setup? Um, the setup value lookup table. Delay calculation: the gate delays are calculated are taken from library. So cell delay, uh, 
this is the cell delay, gate delay is nothing but the cell delay, it comes from the library, from the standard cell library. Net delay is from post layout data, delay calculation, gate delay is interpolated from the non-linear uh, non delay model lookup table, we saw that in, in unit 3. Net delays are either they are by load models in, in that case they are estimated. When we feed in the actual net delays by SPF and DSPF by putting in SPF and DSPF, they are calculated. So SPF and DSPF they do not contain delays. They contain the R and C information, the resistance and capacitance information of each and every net. Using this R and C value, the, the STA tool has to calculate the delay, right? So they are calculated using algorithms, and these algorithms, let's say prime time, what prime time will try to do, it will try and match the spice. So spice is the difference. It will try and match the delay calculation to the, the algorithm will try and so spice is very time consuming. If you try to do spice on the complete so the, the most accurate way, the most accurate static timing analysis should be done using spice. But if you do that for a full shift, it will take days and days. What a state tries to do, it tries to make the process much more faster. Obviously, in the process of making things faster, so one thing. It doesn't work at the NMOS level, NMOS, PMOS level, transistor level, it works at the gate level, that helps a lot in terms of abstraction. Second thing, it will use some fast algorithms to calculate the net delay. But also it will try and make sure that these net delays are within let's say 1 or 2 percent of this file data and they do not deviate much. So here the reference point is spice. But you don't have to worry, worry about spice when they are doing SC. This is the job of the tool, right, not the job of the user. So the tool, for example, prime time claims that the delay calculation is within some percentage of the size. So we will just uh, take their word for it and, and do our work, right. Let us look about, let us uh, take a look at the timing parts. Uh, so uh, the tool will start at the input, it will stop at the first sequential element it encounters, input to register path, again it will start at the clock input. Add the register, it will again stop at the data input of the any flop it founds. This is called register to register path. Again, it will start at the clock input until unless it finds the output port. Obviously, there should not be any sequential logic in between. So, that the last with this kind of path is called register to output path. If it does not find any sequential element and directly encounters output path, it is called a combination path or a feed through path. There are four basic kind of paths, there are more than that. Path start point is the launch part, you have seen that the timing report will show this as a launch part. It starts with either input pin, input port or the clock pin of a sequential element. So in this case it is either a port, this part or the clock pin of the sequential element. End point, the capture part can be either output port, this it should be port here, output port or the data pin of a sequential element. So path is captured here. Here and here. Checking is always whether the capture part, launch part from the data part, right? So we have seen timing reports, we will see lot more in this uh, unit. Timing paths are all always grouped according to some 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 principle. The principle is that the capture they are grouped into path groups by the clocks which are controlling the end point. So for example, path from A to D here, path starting at A. Captured being captured at D, the path group is clock one, clock one. So path one is from A to D of this FF2, and path one comes under the group clock one because the capture clock is clock one. Path two is from FF2 to FF3. It comes under the group clock two because the capture clock is clock two. Path three is from Q of this from from clock of this clock two to Z. Now path 3, if you do not give any output delay on Z, it will come under the default group. Similarly, path 4 comes, starts from A, ends at Z, and assuming we have not specified any output delay on, on Z, it will come under default. However, if you specify output delay on Z using let us say clock 2, it will come under the path of clock 2. So SCA tools like client time, they will generate time in reports. And sort them by the path groups, right? So it will show the timing report with the each path group. The complete list we have seen register to register path. How are they constrained? By just defining the clock. We have seen this in unit three. 
Please review that. We will also see some equation uh, in the uh, following slides. Input register path can be constrained by defining the clock and the input delay. Register to output paths are constrained by defining the clock and the output delay. So, what do you do first? You define clock, you define proper input delays, you define proper output delays. This will constrain most of your paths. Input to output paths, fully combination paths can be constrained using virtual clocks, we have seen an example, or using max delay maintenance. Then there are separate paths, separate path groups for uh, clock gating. Clock gating paths are special because uh, the clock gating element is special. Then async default recovery and remove. So these are again separate path groups. So four register to register, input to register, register to output, input to output. Apart from these basic four, you have clock gating, async default, and a default path group. Okay, so in all they are seven. Again, we have we have seen this net delay uh, is a total time. Uh, which needs to charge or discharge all the power circuit capacitances. Cell delay is nothing but the delay it takes the signal to traverse from input to output. So the part delay is the sum of net delay and cell delay. Now uh, there are various terminologies. Most of you, it you will be uh, most of them you are already familiar with. But, but I'll expand each of this setup and hold time, recovery removal, pulse width, signal skew, clock latency, clock skew, stack and critical path, and uh, these are timing exceptions for us and let us look at them. So, I will define this again uh, set up and hold times for an edge triggered element like a flip flop. The time interval before the active clock edge during which the data should be unchanged is called a set up time. So, in this uh, diagram, in should be stable at least set up time before the clock edge. This is a constraint, this is a property of the sequential element. Similarly, hold is the time interval after the active clock edge. During which data should be unchanged, this is called hold time. Setup and hold are the properties of the sequence itself. They are calculated from the lookup tables given in the lab. Right? You've seen that. I call this a classic timing problem between a register FF1 and a register FF2. The delay of the combination logic is TPOM here. TPD is the propagation delay of flip flop 1, TS and TS. H are set up and hold times for flip flop. So now let us see the timing equations. We will review the timing equations. We will see how the setup and hold time actually affect the, the checking and uh, what happens if they volume. Now setup check. TPD plus TCOM, uh, let us uh, we will go back and forth. So the data will be relaunched by the flip flop form at the active edge of the clock. It will take TPG delay to go from to traverse the flip flop plus it will take TCOM delay to reach the D. So TPD plus TCOM D0 is the old data, D1 is the new data. Flip flop 1 is launching D0. Uh, so flip flop 2 gets D0 after TPD plus TCOM. Okay, let us review the uh, setup and hold timing constraint for the uh, sequential element like a flip flop. So, for such an element, the time interval before the active clock edge during which data should not be changed is called a setup time. Let us look at the figure. So, this is the active clock edge. Set up at least the setup time before this active clock edge, data should remain stable. The whole time is a timing constraint, uh, represents the timing constraint after the active clock edge during which the data should not change. So, data should remain stable at least set up time before the active edge and hold time after the clock active edge. During this window, data should not change or to make sure that the sequential element captures the data pro properly. Now, let us look at the, uh, the classic timing problem. That means uh, data is being launched by a flip flop FF1. Is being captured by the flip flop FF2. TPD is the propagation delay for FF1. TS and TH are the setup and hold time constraints for FF2. TCOM is the uh, delay for the combination element in between. Now, FF1 will launch data at the active edge, it will launch D0. Uh, and uh, after the delay TPD plus TCOM, 
So it will launch D1 or D0. D0 is the old data. D1 is the new data. So flip flop one. So let's say uh, after TPD plus TCOM, D1 will start reflecting at D. So here at this point, at this data pin of FF2, flip flop one will launch new data D1. After TPD and TCOM, data will appear at D of FF2. Here the data will start changing here. Since data changes here. It should and to meet the constraint, the setup constraint of FF2, data should not change in this TS window, right? So, if we represent this using the timing equation, it is something like this TPD plus TCOM, that is the combinational delay plus the delay of the launching top, should be less than TCK minus PF. That means this is TCK. This complete that the delay between this active edge and this active edge. We subtract the setup time because the data should not change P S before this. So P P K minus P S and T P D plus C com should be less than this, right? Now we will uh, so total part delay is P P D plus C com. It is called the part delay, combination delay plus the launch, uh, uh, the sequential elements launch delay. Now see, look at this equation. Uh, I will underline this, this equation. The left hand side, that is this side, is the part delay, and this side is the constraint. The equation is of the form path delay less than constraint. Since it is less than constraint, so that means PCD minus PS is nothing but a maximum value that the part delay can have. PCK is more in most of the cases it is fixed. I am designing a CPU for one gigahertz. TCK will be the, the time period of the clock, which is a one gigahertz clock, right? TS in most of the cases it is a value. It is a very tight range. TS is nothing but the setup time of the clock, and setup time of the clock depends on the transition value of the of the data pin and the clock pin. So it's, it is constrained within a very tight value. It is not in user control. It is not design dependent, right? So this TCK minus PS gives us the maximum maximum time this combination logic can have. In fact, TPD also is not under user control to a great extent, right? Because it's just the delay of the single clock, right? What is what is design? What design comes in while designing the, the combination clock? So TCOM is actually under user control. So your propagation delay, your path delay should be less than some maximum value. That is why setup check is also called max delay check. What is slack? Slack is constrained. What is constrained? TCK minus TS. What is delay? TCD plus TCOM. If the slack is positive, timing is met. If the slack is negative, timing is violated. Now, what happens if setup violates on a chip? Let's say I designed a CPU. I had some problem in my SDA. I did not know how to do it properly. The chip is fabricated and now does not work at one gigahertz. We try and make it now. Externally, we can control TCK. So there is a crystal crystal on chip which we can program for the, the clock. Now what I do is I program it for 900 milliseconds and see if it works. And if the setup violates, so now by increasing the value of TCK, at some point it might start to meet. So even if the setup violates in STA, when the chip is fabricated. The chip might work at a lower frequency because the setup is frequency block frequency dependent, right? That is why when you go into market and try to purchase processors, the processors come under various uh, uh, frequency grades. Right? They, you, so you might get a, a core to do for 3.2 gigahertz, again for 3 gigahertz, 2.8 gigahertz, and 2.8 will be cheaper than 3.2, right? So you all know that mostly. So are they different chips? No, they are same chips. But as ST was done properly, it does not mean that ST is not done properly. But what may happen due to process variation, some of the slower chips they don't meet the 3.2 gigahertz. So, but they need 2.8 gigahertz. Good, we can sell it for less, right? So the chip still works in case of setup violation, but at a lower frequency, right? Again, now let's look at the uh, let's look at the situation from the corner ST point of view. Now, what happens at the worst corner? At worst corner, 
TPD is more, TCOM is more, TCK is fixed, it is the performance thing, it is the clock frequency that we specify, TCK is fixed, but TPD and TCOM increase, right? TS might also increase a bit because the temperature is increasing. So, if we make sure that all our setup constraints are met at the worst one, then we have made sure that they also work at the minimum because TPD plus TCOM attains a maximum value at the worst one. This is why setup is called a max delay check. This is why the corner base ST mentions that. Let's go back to the corner base ST. Worst case corner is setup critical. That means this is the corner which would be bad for setup. You have to make sure that setup works in this corner. So, just by looking at this equation, we are able to deduce that setup check is a max value, maximum value check and it is most critical at the worst case. Okay. Let us go to hold check. Now, what, what hold? So, just look at this, uh, this figure carefully. Now, see that what setup check is, is trying to do, it is trying to make sure that FF2 captures D1 properly. That means, D1 should be set up properly before FF2 can capture it. Before the, 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 the okay, in this case, the, uh, okay, the diagram is not too good. The negative edge is shown as the capture edge. This edge is shown as the capture edge. But it doesn't matter. This could, uh, we could shift the pauses to here if you want So it, it is making sure that this uh, setup check that FF2 captures data properly what data the data d1 the new data what ff1 launches now let's look at the whole slide now in whole what the, what, what is the check the check is that d0 the, uh, ff1 will launch new data d1 so d0 will transition into d1 at some point of time what is that time it is nothing but TPD plus TCOM. So, same as the setup that thing D0 transitions into D1 after TPD plus TCOM. Same thing goes for whole. But now we have to make sure that during this transition D0 to D1, this data, this transition should only happen after the TS time, after the whole time. Right? And I will repeat, it is very important to understand that setup and launches data. D1, old data was D0, D0 transitions into D1, but the constraint here is that data for FS2 should not change within this window, within the TH window. So, TPD plus TCOM should be greater than TH. What this check is telling us that this is making sure that data, old data D0 is captured properly by FS2, right. So, uh, the setup check will make sure that the, the data gets is set up before the clock is properly. The whole check will make sure that data is held for some time. Data is held for some time. These rules held for at least th time before it could transition into D1. In terms of equation, TPD plus TCOM should be greater than TH. Again, let's analyze this. Part delay TPD plus TCOM same as before. TH comes from the library whole time constraint. What is the equation type? Equation is this type. Then part delay is greater than a minimum value. So, whole check will constrain the part delay for a minimum value. That is why this check is also called min delay check. Now, if we combine both setup and whole equation, we see that part delay TPD plus TCOM remains same. The maximum value is TCK minus TS, the minimum value is TS. Right. So, for every path, for every timing path, the path delay should be, every time you see that in the timing reports, for every timing path, there is a maximum value and a minimum value. Max check or max check is also, setup check is also called a max delay check, whole check is also called a min delay check. Right. What happens if whole dollars on a chip? Nothing. You can throw the chip. You can do nothing. Why? Because there is no nothing you can play with once the chip gets manufactured. Everything is fixed. There is no clock frequency here to work with. 
This is why when you go into the industry and you start working on real estate, you will see that the setup is checked at probably one corner or two corners, hold is checked at six corners, eight corners. Why? Because we are very sensitive about hold. There can be a setup violation. You can manufacture it with a small setup violation, but not with a hold. You have to make sure that all the hold timing can be done. Again, we will try to map this equation to the corner based SPA. Now, what happens for a for a worst corner? For a worst corner, TPD is more, TCOM is more. It is good for hold, right? There is more delay. So, it will meet the minimum values, minimum timing constraint. So, no problem. When you go to best case corner, TPD starts decreasing, TCOM starts decreasing. So, the best case corner is bad for hold. That is why we say that. It is hold critical. The best case corner is hold critical. So, you should be very clear that setup check is the max delay check, hold check is the min delay check. What is STA? Hold should be met in best, best case corner, setup should be met in worst case corner. In fact, let us say you choose n number of corners. Bottom line is all the setup and hold. Constraint should be met in all the corners. That is the idea. But we know that worst case corners, the, the, the corners that have more delay on cell will be more critical for setup. The corners that have less delay on cell which is, will be more critical for hold. Right. So again, the bottom line: max delay and min delay. These are the two things you have to remember: max delay is setup, min delay is hold. All formulae. All timing paths you can understand if you understand how the equation is represented. I will repeat path delay less than maximum constraint is the max delay check, which is this TPD plus TCOM less than TCK minus TF. For hold, path delay is greater than the constraint is the min delay check. That is it. That is the whole summary of STA. Now, what we will do, we will apply this principle of max delay check and min delay check to all other timing paths that we will see and we will we'll see how this matches up, right. Now, let us talk about input to register path. So, input to register path, the input comes from an external world, external to our design or external to our chip. So, there is something called input arrival time, which defines the time interval during which data signal can arrive at a pin in relation to the nearest the active clockage that triggers the data point. Now, let us say this is the clock on which the external device operates. External device will launch the data and this data is captured inside a chip. Both for both rise and fall, there will be a timing window during which the data can transition. This is the timing window. So, the data can come, let us say uh, we are talking about uh, uh, let us say some interface, let us say IPC or Let's say the data can come to NS after this clock edge, and two NS can be minimum value, and for maximum it could be five NS. So what we are saying is that the interface is such that so so the external device will also again chip. It will have process variations. There will be wires on the, on the on the circuit board that will connect the two chips together. It will have some variation. So we are saying that the data can arrive at your Boundary between 2 and 5 nanoseconds of the trigger edge, right? So the min value is 2, the max value is 5. So this is the way the input arrival time is characterized. Now, what is input delay? Let us look at the, the equations now. So now we know that okay, there is something called input arrival time, and in in most of the famous interfaces, this input arrival time or input delay is already given, it is already published, right. So, you can use the same value directly, you just have to be make sure that you use the proper max value for the max delay, proper min value for the min, min part of the delay. In most, in some cases you have to estimate this input delay. Now, this slide will tell you how to estimate the input delay. Now, uh, external world, let us say the delay is in, the input arrival time is in. It and after t in, the data arrives at input. T combination, this is internal to your chip and FF1 since it is captured, we are worried about the setup time here, it will have PS and TF. PS and TH are the setup and hold time. Now, for setup, again the equation is the same type, T in plus T com 
should be less than TCK minus TS. Right, so TS is a set of time constraint. This is the Maxwell equation again. Now, what what I am doing here is I am rearranging the equation in such a manner that on left hand side I'll keep what I need to in to uh, what I need to evaluate. What I what I need to estimate. I need to estimate the input delay path. So I'll keep the T in something which is external to our world. So I'll keep T in on the left side. On the right side, I'll keep all that which is is internal to our chip and known. So T com, T C K and T S are all internal to my design and are known to me. So T in is less than T C K minus T S minus T com. Please note again, it is a set of timing constraint. You need to represent this equation in the form of estimate less than constraint, less than sign. Estimate less than constraint. Again, this is the estimate part. This is the maximum that it could have. So, estimate less than the Maxwell constraint is the Maxwell equation or the set of equation. So, how do I estimate an input delay? Now, let's say the clock frequency is 10 millisecond, and let's say set of time of this clock is 1 millisecond, and let's say I have some combination element which takes let's say 3 nanoseconds. So, frequency of 10, set of timing constraint of 1, combination delay of 3. I know how much. So, by using this. I say 10 minus 1 minus 3. That means I have 6 nanoseconds that I can give to the experiment. This is the way you can estimate input delay if the input delay is not already known for famous interface. Right? Now we will do it for hold. Right? For hold, again, we will present the equation in terms of estimate greater than a minimum value. Right? For hold, T in plus T com should be greater than T S. For this clock, no clock frequency comes into play here. Again, I'll rearrange. I'll uh, what I I know what I know. I'll keep on the right hand side, which will form the constraint part. What I'm trying to estimate will come on the left hand side. Again, estimate is greater than some value. What is the value of TS minus TCOM? Now let's look at it in the practical sense. Now TCOM here. If you have some combination delay here. Whole time of clocks are not uh, 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 not uh, big values. They are for let's say for 45 nanometer, they will be in the range of up to 0.1 nanosecond, 0.2 nanosecond maximum, right? So if you have a significant combination delay, you don't need to worry about those. Why? Because this is already met. T in would be uh, greater than T H. So even if you have an input delay of zero for the whole case, this value here would be negative because T combination let's say is one nanosecond. Hold is let's say 0.1, so this will be negative, and the value of zero will with this condition will be met. So if you have combination delay from input to the first flop that captures it, it helps for hold. Does not help for setup, right? So for setup, since the constraint is maximum, we want the delay to be less. For hold, we want the delay to be more, and that is the ST problem. We need to make sure that all part delays meet on both sides. On the win side as well as on the max side. Right. Let's look at output uh, register to output path. So something called output required time on the input is what input arrival time. Right. On the output side it is output required time. Output required time specify the data required time on output ports. We will uh, launch the data from the clock. And required time directly specifies the timing to logic field. Let's see the in terms of uh, equations. Again, uh, now on the output side, since we are talking about the output side, we have a flop that is launching data after TPD. We have a combination delay. And let's assume on the external world there is a flop that has uh, timing constraints of TF and TH. Now let's look at the equation. T out is let the, let's say there is some combination cloud in on the output side with T out in. Now I'll arrange. What is the part delay? TTD plus TCOM plus T out plus TS plus TS is less than TCK. You could also have TCK minus T at the same time. Again, I'll rearrange. On the left hand side, I'll keep what is the optimal form, what is the external world. What is the external world? T out and TS. And I'll rearrange. So T out plus TS should be less than TCK minus TTD plus T out. What this tells me is that. Let's say there's a clock frequency again. Then I'll use this. Then I'll 
let's say the propagation delay is 2 nanosecond, combination delay is 2 nanosecond. So, 2 plus 2 4, 10 minus 4 is 6. It tells me that I can give 6 nanosecond to the output wall, output side, because I am consuming 4 nanosecond inside, right. So, this will help us in giving and estimating the output delay for the external world. Hold is much more interesting and slightly complex. Now, for hold, what is the part delay? TPD plus TCOM plus T out, same thing, part delay is same. It should be greater than TH. This is the equation, right? I will rearrange left hand side is the estimate part, TH is the estimate, TH I do not know. So, I will take TH on the left hand side. So, T out minus TH. On the right hand side, I will have minus TPD plus TCOM, right? The set output delay. So, how do you define output delay? We say set output delay. How do you separate between setup and hold? We say minus mass for setup, minus min for hold. Please remember if you have a constraint like set output delay minus min, that is for hold, and the value there is positive, you need to take a relook. You need to check again because this tells me, this equation tells me that you have to give a negative value. Negative value does not mean, it only means that. This is the way STA tools understand data. How do we arrive on this? We have written the equation like this. We have rearranged the equation to conform to some standard. What is that standard? The standard says that part your estimate should be greater than something for hold. How do we arrive? So we rearrange and this the right hand side value is negative. Set output delay minus min should almost always be negative. If it is positive, if you are giving a positive value, you should rethink. Posit giving a positive value most of the times is a problem, is an error, and it will result into optimistic analysis. Please be very careful. Go through these equations. You have to just remember two things how to write equation for a max delay, how to write equation for a min delay. These equations are almost of the same format as the register to register equation. Other things, important things that STA checks are pulse width and signal skew. Pulse width is the time between active and inactive states of the same signal. When are, when are pulse width important? Pulse width is very important for memory. So, memories, uh, the hard memory, that is the uh, full custom memories, uh, like single port or uh, register file, have a min pulse width check on the clock. That means, what it means is that if you give up clock which has a pulse width which is smaller than something either for the, the high edge or the low edge, the low pulse or the high pulse, the memory will not work. So, memory needs a minimum pulse width on the both high pulse and the, and the both the max pulse and the min pulse. So, I am sorry, both on the it needs a min pulse value or both the high and the low pulse, right. So, for example, uh, uh, a memory might have and that is this check is independent of the of the setup and hold right. So, you need to make sure that uh, so what uh, so this, if you do report constraints on a solve variable, this report will tell you all the setup volitions, all the whole volition, it will also tell you all the min pulse right. Again, there is a signal through amount of time it takes a signal to transition from uh, uh, from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0, it takes into account the uncertainty in transition. So, this can be from either 10 percent of VDD to 90 percent of VDD or 20 percent of VDD, 80 percent of VDD. This is defined by a technology library, we have seen that in this case, right. So, uh, this is these these are the two things apart from the setup and hold constraints that SK tool says, right. Uh, signal through where the max transition takes that check the signal. And also, please note that slower transitions we saw result into more short circuit power. So, they are not open. So, it is good to have faster transition times. There is something called clock latency. So, clock latency is a difference between. So, this is the port of the design where we create the clock. Now, let us say you have a flop. Uh, clock is just tells me that this is a this is one flop, this is another flop, this is third flop. The clock to the flop A, flop B and flop C reach through three different networks. Now, uh, let us say there are there is a path from clock A to clock B, right. Now, the latency, what is latency? Let us consider clock A in isolation, forget about clock B and clock C for now. So, the latency at clock A, it will have two values, a rise and a fall. Now, let us say clock rises here. So, 
it will rise here rise fall rise fall rise yes there are four inverted in place right rise delay here is 7 fall delay is 4 so what is the total amount of delay the clock takes from plk to plk a it has two rise transitions and two fall transitions right so two rise transitions between 7 plus 7 is 14 Two rise transitions means fourteen. Uh, four plus four eight, so fourteen plus eight is twenty-two. So the clock latency at CLK A point is twenty-two. Similarly for CLK B, clock rises here, clock falls here, clock is there's a buffer here, clock falls here, right? So the fall latency at CLK B is four. It is fall plus fall again eight because clock rise means fall here. And this rise and fall means regarding the output relation to the output. So rise latency at CLK B. How do we calculate rise latency? Uh, let me clear the data first. So how do we cal calculate rise latency? Rise uh, rise at CLK B. We need to calculate rise latency. Rise at CLK B means rise at this point. Rise delay seven. Rise at this point means fall at this point. Fall is four. Four plus seven is eleven. Right. So this way you can calculate latency. Latency is just the the time it takes from the clock creation point to the the point we are interested in. Clock A is mostly the capture at a particular clock. The second thing called which is called clock skew. Now clock skew is in relation to two points. The difference in delay between two points. These two or two points being the clock pin of the two register. So we we'll, we we'll, when we talk about skew. There's a skew between clock A and clock B, clock B and clock C, clock A and clock C, clock B and clock C. So any two pins you pick up, any two clock pins, the difference in arrival times is the clock skew. So how do I calculate clock skew? I calculate like this. I calculate, for example, for clock A and clock B, you calculate the rise latency at clock A, rise latency at clock B. So the the clock rise skew would be rise at clock B minus rise at clock A. The absolute value. Similarly, you can calculate fall. So you know the clock latency at clock A, clock B, and clock C. That means rise and fall latency separately. And clock Q between any two between any two uh, points would be simply the difference of the clock latency. We will see how clock clock Q is very very important. We will see why. Right? Uh, when we uh, look at the post layout data, we will see how clock Q is important. Clock skew changes the way. So now let's go back to let's um, let's go back to the setup and hold time. Now setup. Let's just set up. Go to this window. Here. Now here we are assuming that clock is arriving at the same time between at the two clocks F1 and F2. At F1 and F2, we are assuming that the clock arrives at the same same point. This is called ideal clock. This is the pre-layout clock, right? And uh, What but what about the post layout? The post layout, the clock edge, the active clock edge will be either coming late or coming earlier. What if it comes earlier? If it comes earlier, your window is shortened. Your setup timing is more constrained, right? Let's talk talk about hold. What happens if the captured clock comes later? You are more constrained for hold. It's a problem for hold if the the, the captured clock comes later. So this is where the clock skew is very important. In post layout data, prime time calculates the clock latency for every clock, and it knows the clock skew between every pair. It doesn't calculate clock skew separately, but since it knows latency at every point, in the timing report you can see the clock skew, right? So this is why clock skew is very important. We will see in uh, how do we uh, in pre layout how do we estimate clock skew, and in post layout how do we handle clock skew, right? So we saw about uh, clock latency, clock skew. We have discussed slack and critical. We have discussed what is slack. Slack is, an, is the difference between the clock delay and the constraint. Negative slack means that constraint has not been satisfied. Positive slack indicates that the constraint is met. SCA tool calculates the slack of each timing path in order to find the critical path. Critical path is any logic path that violates timing constraints. Any path that means any path with negative slack is called a critical path. Right? There can be multiple critical paths. Uh, we saw that how DC handles critical paths. If we try to 
reduce the worst negative slack and the total negative slack on the critical paths. That is the idea of optimization. Uh, we have seen this. This slide just uh, gives the summary of how do we calculate slack. We have seen that in setup and hold timing equations, how the slack is calculated. Slack is nothing but uh, you can review this slide at later. Uh, it, it tells that how the slack is calculated for input register, register to output, register to register, and input to output box, right? So you can, uh, the first thing, the, the most important thing for you is to understand the equations I have discussed before. If you understand the equations, you can actually write equations for any kind of timing path, and you can understand how setup and hold timing are checked, right? Even on complex parts, there are some parts which can get complex, there are certain timing, uh, certain interfaces that have some complex timing tips. But if you know how to write the equation for setup and for hold, you can understand any path. You can uh, understand any timing report. What are recovery and removal times? Recovery time is the time available between the asynchronous. It is it is a specific to asynchronous signal. Setup and hold timing is characteristic of synchronous signals. Recovery and removal is characteristic of asynchronous signals. It is a time available between asynchronous signal going active going inactive to the active blockage. For example, we say 10 going inactive, it should go inactive at least some time before the active blockage. This constraint is called the recovery time, it is very similar to setup. Removal time is similar to hold, that means it is the timing between active blockage and the asynchronous signal going inactive. The, oh, the difference between the recovery removal and setup hold is this, setup and hold is for both the edges. Active, I mean, there's nothing called active and inactive in case of synchronous signals and data signals. Both data going from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 0, for both there will be a setup and hold time. But for, uh, for asynchronous signals like reset, only the inactive, the, the transition going from active to inactive is important. Why? Because when it goes to active, the, the functionality is very clear. Whenever reset goes into active, data goes to 0. That's it. No timing constraint. But when the signal goes inactive, now let's say the signal is going inactive here, very second. This clock edge is the active clock edge, and we have to make sure that whatever data transition happens here is reflected on the clock. But if the reset violates here, if it changes somewhere, let's say here, and it violates the recovery, the Q of this clock will remain zero because it still considers reset to be active because the recovery condition is not met. Similarly for removal, for removal also this is the active edge, but this edge should not have any effect, why because reset is still active here. But let us say it is removed earlier, the reset is removed earlier, then this clock edge might affect the data, but since the reset is 0 here data should be 0, but since you have removed it earlier it might be a problem. So that is why the edges, go, the, the reset edges going to inactive are important, not the active going edges. This is why you will see that recovery and removal are only in one direction. Let us say you are active to reset, recovery is only characterized for reset going to home, going inactive and not the other way. You can open up the standard cell library, you can go to a flop and you can see how reset and how recovery and removal time are represented. Uh, let's talk about timing exceptions. I will briefly introduce false path and multi-cycle path. These three I will talk about later. So, what are false paths? False paths are paths in the design that exist. According to STA tool, they exist, but they are not possible. They are not sensitized in any input condition. Let us see an example. Let us say you have two muscles here, both are controlled by the same select pin, right? Both are controlled by the same select pin. So, if select is 0, A will be passed on, and here C will be passed on to output, right? If select is 1, B will be passed on to C, and again C will be. Uh, see there is some branch, so there are two branches of two, uh, one is going through buffer, the other is going directly, it will be passed on to out. Now see this path, path starting from A and uh, or yeah, path starting from A and going to this branch. 
so this path consider this path starting at a and going to this branch is this path possible no why because if the select pin is same so if selected zero this will go through but this will be blocked on on select then select is zero let's consider two cases select zero this path is blocked because this is a one path this path is enabled so this path is not activated now let's consider the case when select is one this path is activated but this path is not so this path is not possible but why why then this path is uh, even showed so if you don't do anything prime time will show a path which are not possible design wise logically so prime time will show this path this path this path and this path it will show all possible paths why because it is static in nature it does not con consider logic values it considers all possibility it does not consider any logic value on s right it will assume s is not there is no value on s s can be anything therefore all paths are possible it does not consider the case where s is controlling both the maxes so as a user it becomes our job to tell the tool that what to do so what we could do we can tell the tool that hello from this path is not true this path is not true you can do this in multiple ways there are multiple ways of doing things one of the very famous ways called false path you could say that false path and you can say from and to there is one more way we will talk about it later but this is meant by false path all paths are paths in design that are not logically possible but still showed by the static and okay. one more example let's say you know that there is some flop in your design which is which never changes its value it is always static there can be multiple reasons this uh, can be software programmable and uh, software programmable registers are mostly one time they change only one time or they don't change at all they have this fixed value any path any setup check starting from this block or any hold check starting from this block is false why because the value never changes so no change in value means that it is not going to trigger any setup or hold check so such that but time time does not know that state tool does not know that you have to tell the state tool that that's false path from which is this is one example we will see lot more this in in lab sessions Another type of exception is the multi-cycle path. Multi-cycle paths are data paths that require more than one clock period for execution. Now let's say you have a big combination of it, and you know that this is going to take more than one clock time, and you don't want to add pipeline here. You don't want to add any pipeline. So you can tell, and it will boil it, right? It will boil it. So this constraint is both false path and multi-cycle path are also important for synthesis. You don't want synthesis to to optimize false paths you don't want synthesis to unnecessarily work on a combination cloud logic which you know it is going to boil it so you have to tell the tool that set multi cycle path minus from this minus to this will take more than one cycle we will see commands later don't worry about the commands but this is a way you can tell the tool that my uh, logic will take more than one copy so we will we'll see if this is very interesting we will see how a state will handle this right how does the report timing looks like this the idea of uh, this session is just to introduce you to the concept of multi cycle path and false path again what dc what what sta tool checks are boundary condition they are same as uh, what design compiler does but please note sta post out sta as actual net statistics so Uh, also, you could specify so the boundary conditions are something which you could specify proper SDA. Again, we are same command set load set driving cell set into command. Same as what we discussed in unit two. So let's summarize SDA flow. Very similar to synthesis, nothing uh, nothing different. Redesign data, library design parasitics. This is important here. This is new here. Apart from synthesis, post load SDA. Apply constraints. Now these constraints here. Will be slightly more than what we did in synthesis. We'll see why. Because uh, we are talking about post layout, some things will change, the nature of clocks will change. So.
so uh, we will see how do we modify or add to these constraints what important things we need to focus on but know for sure that the constraints here will be slightly more than what we applied in p right third thing we have to check that the design is properly and fully constrained and there are no drc violations what happens when there are drc violations you cannot rely on time and date i have talked a lot about this in the previous book so back if you are confused about how drc violations cause in the lab time results you can go to the and go to the sessions again last part is that we report we report all the time and violations we report what is the set up uh, the report time and set up or if we do a report time and hold we do report constraints on is all valid we will show that we want right this is an exercise uh, i will not solve it here but uh, the clock is a very simple thing you can apply your equations here uh, this figure will help uh, it will tell that this is a setup launch edge this is a setup factor edge this is a hold hold check this is a hold check these two edges will be hold check or these two edges doesn't matter so what you could do you could uh, you could take one of the labs and you can do a report timing and understand that what this figure tells is actually matches with the report timing plus you can use the equations i have talked about before in the previous slides and calculate what you should calculate you should calculate setup slack hold slack you can estimate input delay and estimate output delay please note now what is special here is that i have included the max and min values for both so the combination logic here will not have the same value for the best case and the worst case right the combination logic will have a greater value in max case which is 5 ns here and a lesser value in the for the best case array which is 3 ns here clock period does not change i am assuming that setup and hold constraints don't change right clock to queue delay again the clock delay is going to be more for worst case corner than uh, less for the min case corner calculate setup stack calculate hold stack please make sure to use the correct values estimate input delay so there is no combination logic here assume that there is zero combination logic here and zero combination logic here assume this goes to an output code directly and assume this comes from input code directly you should be able to estimate input delay and output delay please do this for all both the max corner and the min corner okay so uh, i hope you will be able to solve this very easily uh, just by you just you just have to go back understand the equations come back here and solve it uh, just a two minute job right summary so what we discussed in the session was about the concept of spa how the tool will break all the paths take it consider all the paths it will break each of these paths into into register and register and input to in in the path groups the path group is characterized by the capture block spa has two parts first is delay calculation cell delays cell delays are calculated from library data Net delays. Net delays come from the parasitic uh, file. We'll see more about that in in one of the sessions. So delay is calculated, and then delay is checked against the timing constraints. What are timing constraints? They are of two types: max delay constraint and min delay constraint. Max delay constraints are usually checked in the worst case corner. I mean, the worst case corner should be is critical for max delay constraint. Max delay constraints are of the setup constraint type. min delay constraints are critical at the best case corner and min delay checks are also called the hold check that's all for this session in the next session we'll discuss more about the paths and we'll see a lot more about the clocks thank you